this is uh, actually a recording that's going into the archive. It will be there for the future. Uh, the Heritage Keepers Project, which has been kind of an ongoing project for the museum for several years, and, and it's had kind of a rejuvenation uh, lately where we are interviewing as many people as we can about Nassau County, about Amelia Island, about Fernandina Beach, and uh, we certainly want to uh, encourage anybody, if you know of anybody who maybe should be interviewed uh, to get your story uh, into the archive, please let us know. And if you'd like to volunteer to interview someone, perhaps you have an, uh, a friend who really needs to be interviewed but they can't really leave home, we could train you on how to go ahead and use the equipment and uh, interview that person for the archive. But we're really happy for Pride Month to be able to get into the archive, the history and the story of what is pride, what does it mean, and uh, you know how these three people who are leaders in our community um, uh, actually have made a difference in terms of making the community uh, visible and uh, uh, viable uh, for Fernandina Beach. So I'm gonna be as interested as anybody because I don't know the whole story either. But what we're gonna do, uh, I'm going to be, I'm not really gonna be interviewing, I think because these guys are all such good speakers. <laughs> this happens to me a lot. I'll go out to interview someone, I'll ask one question and I never get a word in edgewise <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> it's an hour later, okay. <laughs> are you saying we talk a lot? <laughs> <laughs> you know how to talk. So um, we're going to, I'm going to interview them uh, or start the interview and each person will talk for approximately 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll have plenty of times for Q&A at the end because we think it's very important that uh, we all uh, get a chance to talk. So we're going to start with Don and uh, Don is actually a very prominent person in the pride movement nationally as well as we're so fortunate to have him now in Fernandina and so um, as I usually do I'm, I, I would ask you Don could you please tell us how uh, about your life how you ended up knowing that uh, you might want to be involved with something like pride and how did you get into that in the beginning okay um, first, thank, thank all of you for being here. It's really wonderful to see this many people interested um, in our um, program, in our community. Um, June 29th, Sunday, 1969, I'm in the den with my grandmother watching the CBS Evening News. And the last report on that newscast had grainy footage of black and, uh, black, black and white grainy footage of homosexuals rioting in New York City. And I was just amazed. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. And part of me was thinking, gosh, anywhere there are homosexuals rioting is where I want to be. <laughs> and so four years later, I moved to New York. And shortly after I moved to New York, I joined the Gay Activist Alliance. The Gay Activist Alliance was uh, the first organization was the Gay Liberation Front. That was formed shortly after the riots. And then uh, the Gay Activist Alliance uh, split off from the Gay Liberation Front. And I joined them. And the story I'm about to tell you, I heard firsthand from people that were actually there that night. Friday, the 27th of June. There were, oh, probably at least four or five reasons why the Stonewall Inn could have been raided that night. The first was that there was dancing, but they did not have a cabaret license. In New York City, if you have dancing, you must have a cabaret license. The second was that it was against the law to dress in the clothing of the opposite sex, and there were people that were doing that uh, in that room. And um, uh, the... Um, Third was that you could not dance with someone of the, op of the same sex. So you had to, you know, they were breaking that law. But back then, every single gay bar in New York City was owned by 
by the mob. They were all owned by the mafia. And all of the bars paid a commission, shall we call it, <laughs> to the police department to, uh, to make sure that they could operate, all right? Well, somebody on, during that week forgot to pay the commission to the police department. And that is why the raid happened, um, to teach them a lesson, you know? But they did not count on one thing. That was the day that Judy Garland was buried, that day. Every drag queen of any stature <laughs> was on Madison Avenue in front of the Frankie Campbell funeral home. They would not allow them in. They would not allow them to go in to view the coffin. So they stood on the opposite side of the street, on the sidewalk, in full drag, in, you know, 85, 90 degree heat for the entire time that the funeral was happening. When they got into the bar that night, they were not happy campers, pardon the pun. But, um, and so they just, they had had it. They had had it up to here. The cops came in, raided, started arresting people, started pulling them out forcefully, throwing them into the, uh, uh, the paddy wagon. Uh, and somebody threw a can. And then somebody else threw a bottle. And then somebody picked up some rocks and started throwing them. And it got so bad that the cops went back into the bar and barricaded themselves in the bar. <laughs> when that happened, a group of drag queens, I kid you not, yanked up a parking meter and was using it as a battering ram to get at the cops that were locked inside the bar. Uh, of course, uh, reinforcements, uh, reinforcements were called in and um, uh, they eventually subdued them, but the riots went on for the next two nights. They rioted again on Saturday and again on Sunday night. And that was the beginning of the movement. Hmm. Wow. Uh, very, very uh, dramatic. But I, uh, so you ended up, though, going to New York I did. years later. And Four what years was later. Happening, what was happening then? Um, it, it, it was uh, completely opposite. There were no more raids. Um, there were, you know, the bars were open. Some of the bars were now owned by individuals that were not connected with the mob. Uh, there were a lot of bars in New York. <laughs> I, when I first got there, I decided I would go to every single one of them to see what they were all like. And it took me a good two months to, <laughs> to do that. Um, and, uh, and then I joined the Gay Activist Alliance, and I went out, I was specifically to join their Speakers Bureau. And I went out in the tri-state area from uh, the beginning of 1974 until about 1977, talking about being gay. We, we addressed uh, school groups, um, both junior high, high school, college, uh, civic organizations, and um, community groups. Uh, and uh, it was very, very interesting. We were almost everywhere we were, um, we were welcomed, and people were very, very interested. And what year was that? Would you 74, think? I started. 74, yeah. yeah. Beginning of 74, January of 1974. And so. so let's uh, continue with your story, though. How, you, how did you end up here? Oh, how did I end up here? Um, well, uh, uh, about uh, well, 10 years ago or so, um, I decided it was time to leave New York City because my rent was about to be quintupled. <laughs> Our building was coming off of, off of stabilization. And um, so my brother-in-law, who's lived here, Dan McCarthy, uh, uh, he and my sister moved down here in the early 80s. My sister passed some time ago. But uh, he invited me to come down and um, you know stay with them. And so I did. And uh, I'm not somebody that can just sit around and do nothing. So I started volunteering. And um, one of the places I volunteered was at the Council on Aging. Mm -hmm. And um, my second day of volunteering there, the boss came out and said, Janice Ankrum, uh, asked me if I would be willing to work for medium, minimum wage. 
And I said, well, I'm doing this for free now, so sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and um, I got hired. And it was Janice who clued me in to Fernandina Beach Pride she, uh, in uh, 2019, right? Well, before that, because I was working with Janice on the soup train, which was part of the Meals on Wheels program as a volunteer. Ah, so okay, yeah. Knew me. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I was in her office one day, and she said, here, you might be interested in this. And I was. And so I called Janice, and I came to the first meeting, and I've been involved ever since. And I put him on the board. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm going to actually pass it now to uh, Teresa. And Teresa Sparks, uh, you actually grew up in Kingsland, Georgia. Can you tell us your story? I would be happy to, and I'll probably talk longer than um, Don does, so <laughs> you may have to say stop, stop, stop. Um, but uh, good afternoon. It is wonderful. I, I concur with Don to see so many people here um, interested and in supporting our community. Well, I am definitely a product of the Deep South. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. At the age of three, my family moved to Kingsland, Georgia, and my father was um, an educator, and my mom was working at home with, at that time, myself and my two-month-old sister. Um, my mother, I don't think, ever forgave my father for moving her from Savannah to <laughs> Kingsland, Georgia, where she swore this was in the summertime uh, that we moved, and she swore that it rained nonstop for the first six weeks that she was there. And she had a toddler and a two-month-old, so, you know, doing diapers and hanging them on the porch, and she was not happy. Um, but um, Kingsland was my home, Kingsland St. Mary's, Camden County, so Fernandina Beach was also a huge part of my growing up. Uh, we moved here right after the big hurricane of 1964, which had done some extreme damage, made my father very, very worried that he had two small children, and what if there was another hurricane? Um, he is now very relieved that, you know, he is still alive living in Kingsland and very relieved that he, you know, did not have to boil water and do other kinds of things, so not, never another direct hit. However, let's look at what it was like in Kingsland, Georgia in the late 60s uh, through the 70s. We were a mill town, pulp mill town at that time. Uh, the naval base did not exist then. Naval base didn't come in until I, my senior year in high school, they began to build that. Um, so it was a relatively rural area. We were pretty traditional um, in the sense that there were more churches than anything else. And so that was the center of our social life, really, was going to church. I am a recovering member of the Southern Baptist Church. Um, <laughs> my father still um, attends the church that I grew up in. Um, however, um, what that meant to me as a child in a very small town, Kingsland at that time probably had a population of about 3,500 to 4,000. So we were a small town. Um, there were three elementary schools in Camden County. There was one in Woodbine, one in Kingsland, and one in St. Mary's. There was only one high school. So after you went first grade through seventh grade, to, that was elementary school, and then you would go eight through 12, and that was high school. So those three elementary schools, of course, fed into the one high school. Traditional in the sense that roles were pretty rigid in our community as far as what men did and what women did. Um, my dad was really funny in the sense that he broke some of those rules, but he didn't want anybody to know about it. So um, he was great about helping mom with cooking, or he might be washing dishes after that had happened. 
uh, after we'd eaten and all. Um, but if anybody knocked on the door, <laughs> he immediately lost the apron and was sitting in his chair watching television. Um, so people weren't really supposed to know that. So that's kind of a weird message to get as a kid. Like, is this okay or is this not? Um, I was the weird one in our family. I'm the oldest of three. And weird in the sense that um, I bucked some of those rules, you know. Number one, I was a daddy's girl and I was a tomboy. But a lot of the girls that I was growing up with were tomboys. We were relatively you know, rural sort of area. Um, I loved hanging with my dad, and he was a vocational educator, so he could do, he could fix anything. It didn't matter if it was the car, or the refrigerator, or it didn't matter. He could do that, and I was always his gopher. So, again, I hated, there's a famous picture of me. I'm about three and a half, and it's Easter Sunday. And if you grew up in the South as a woman on Easter Sunday, it didn't matter your age, three and a half to 87, you had your hat, your gloves, your purse, yes, patent leather, and your patent leather shoes, and a new, very bright and colorful dress. There you go. So I'm about three and a half in this getup. And I'm crying. Oh. <laughs> you know, my, my sister, thank God she came along. She's three years younger than me. Uh, my sister loved that stuff. Thank God. But I was frequently crying in those pictures. And as soon as um, I could take those clothes off, um, they were given to my sister. And she then had two purses and two hats <laughs> and two pair of gloves that she got to wear around. So... I was, I was already sort of not happy with that situation. But you also have to remember, this is late 60s into the 70s. We had a giant antenna for our black and white television, and we got two and a half channels. We could pick up CBS and NBC really pretty well. PBS came in on and off, depending on what the weather was. So, as far as media coverage, never heard the word gay, never heard the word homosexual, ever, until the mid-70s, Anita Bryant. Okay, so now I'm finally hearing that there is this word, homosexual. I don't have a clue what it means, and none of the adults in my life are going to tell me what it means. Um, but the pastor in our church was letting us know that we should support her. Okay. I don't have a clue. I really do not have a clue. But okay, we should support her, and she's against these things, people, whatever it is, called homosexuals. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm in my early teens at this time. And um, one of the things that is also sort of unusual that I'm noticing about myself is all my friends who are girls suddenly have boyfriends and are all gaga about boyfriends. We still had a party line. I don't know if many of you know what a oh, telephone yeah. party line is, but you know, their parents were always upset because they were, you know, holding up the party line. They were on the phone with these boys and they were just talking and nobody could get out on the party line and stuff like that. Well, I wasn't having that problem at all. Um, you know, boys were great. That was fine. You know, they were friends. But I did not understand what was going on with my friends. They just seemed to have lost their minds. <laughs> so, and then I get into the ninth grade. My PE teacher's name is Jennifer Arant. Oh my gosh, now I understand what these girls are thinking about these boys. I am head over heels obsessed with Jennifer Arant. She is, you know, I can see her, at, I can describe her perfectly. She was a brunette, probably about 5'7", very fit, you know. She taught PE. Um, I hung around her any time I possibly could. 
Now, my friends didn't get that. They were like, you know, what's the deal? Um, she is the basketball coach, so I have gone out for high school basketball. Um, I didn't care if I had to be the water girl. I just wanted to be able to hang out. And um, the most horrifying day of my teenage life was we were playing softball in PE, and it was my turn to bat. She was pitching for both. Coach was pitching for both teams. I hit a line drive right into her chest. Oh. <laughs> I cried. I mean, you know, I was just horrified. I ran out to the mound. It was like, you know, do we, do we need to have medics? You know, and she was like, I'm fine. You know, it's good. But it gave me a chance to be really close to her and help her up and help her over to the bench. And, you know, so. You'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. So anyway, my heart was then broken because the next year she moved. And then we had this um, old man who was going to be our PE teacher. So I decided I could find out find something different to do other than PE. Um, so that was, that was a glimpse of, okay, I don't have quite the same feelings as some other people do. Um, but I didn't really get it. So I'm going along. I graduate high school. I think we had 300 in our graduating class, and we were the largest class ever to graduate at that time from Camden County High School. Um, I go off to college. I go to Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. And um, again, I have some really close girlfriends. Um, nothing's ever really sexual at that point, but boy, we are really close. You know, we hang out and we're together a lot. Um, fortunately, I have a um, professor and her husband who moved there to teach, and they came from California. That was good. That was really good. Because they began to introduce, my professor, Marianne Drake, um, she has a course in psychology that she teaches on families. And so as a part of this, one day she has come in and speak um, a couple who are lesbians and have been together for about 30 years. Wow. <laughs> I'm speechless, which is really difficult for anybody to imagine, but I am absolutely speechless. And these are just the coolest women. They're so neat. I mean, they're just like regular people. They are not these monsters that Anita Bryant had described, you know. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, there's this other way of being. So that's eye-opening to me. But I'm still, I don't know, not sure. Um, but my senior year, my very best friend and I move off campus and into an apartment. And um, we're very close, and I'm beginning to think about her in a very different way. That year goes along. I graduate, go to graduate school. So I go to Peabody College at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Another Marianne, a student in my program, comes into my life, and um, I'm talking about this woman a lot, and she finally looks at me and she says, Teresa, I may be going out on a limb here, and I may cut it off behind me, but let me just ask you something. Is this woman your girlfriend, and maybe are you a lesbian? <laughs> wow. Um, and I... I sh in a very shaky voice, say, um, maybe. maybe. Maybe I am. And Marianne's wonderful. She says, oh, well, you know, I saw this in the student paper, and they're trying to get a support group going for staff, faculty, and students that would be an LGBT support group. And I'm like, oh, cool, give me that information. Okay, this is the 80s, and you had to write a letter to a campus post office. They got it. Um, they would then send you back a letter saying, here is where we are meeting, in sort of cryptic kinds of ways of doing, and at, and at this time. And it's off campus, and it's in another student's apartment. And so I'm really nervous. 
but I go. And I step into this room, and it is packed. There must have been 50 people in this one-bedroom apartment. And I'm like, they start talking and talking about things they want to do. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, here is my people. Finally, here is my people. So I was 25, maybe. So for pretty much 22 years, you... I knew something was going on, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have a name for it, and I didn't know there was anybody but me and that kind of thing. Um, and so I get introduced to the women's community in Nashville, which was a wonderful, caring, supportive community. And I get curious about things. You know, I'm like, oh, wow, we have, like, this whole culture. We have music. We have literature. We have art. And it's by people like me. So that was just wonderful and incredible. Um, I'm still not telling anybody. I am in graduate school and working part-time and I'm working with kids. And so it's real clear I'm not going to tell anybody who I am. I am in the closet except when I'm around these folks. So there's still a level of don't step outside. I get involved um, with this wonderful group and they start talking about having the first pride parade in Nashville. And I'm like, this is my next step. I had already been doing some speaking. Um, particularly, I was, work, I was speaking to Methodist churches in that area, in the Middle Tennessee area. And we were talking about what it means to be rejected by your church as a person who is lesbian or gay and how painful that is. Um, and unfortunately, the Methodist Church is still going through that. Um, so I had started doing that, so I was stepping outside of that. People outside the gay community were beginning to see me, and I was okay with that. Um, I came out to my sister, and she was wonderful. Was not gonna come out to my parents, and it would be many years later before I did that. Um, but I began working on putting together the first Pride Parade for Nashville. And I believe, I'm probably going to be a little bit off here, but it was either 1988, 1989 was the first Pride Parade. We had about 100 people um, that participated. Uh, there was one church, Edge Hill United Methodist Church, which was a reconciling congregation at that time. Uh, that participated. Uh, we had primarily people who were LGBT um, that participated in the parade, and we marched from the State House, since Nashville is the state capital, to Centennial Park, which is a really large and beautiful park. And um, we had a great big picnic. We had a number of people who we're demonstrating, but we're not really violent. Um, but I tell you something, marching in that parade was my day of liberation. Mm -hmm. I could never go back sort of after that. And um, from that point on, it became sort of my mission in life to make sure that other people could have that experience. Um, so that sort of brings you up to my... Um, adulthood and um, sort of what things were like and um, I will pass it on to Janice. Yes. Yeah. Thank you Teresa. Um, thank y'all all for being here. I figured there'd be five people here. <laughs> so uh, this is like this is a very nice surprise to see everybody. So um, I I am a, um, I'm a native Floridian. I never lived in Fernandina Beach, but my father's family's from here. They moved here in the 1930s when the mills began to open. So I've been coming here my whole life. And my partner Sue and I bought our first house here in 1999 and then have um, moved here full time in 2008 um, when we both had the opportunity to take an early retirement. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how 
what we are having here, but um, I also had a high school gym teacher. <laughs> I did her, too. I, but I, I her name, she, she I know. Was, her name okay. was Sarita Bradley, and she was the perfect picture of a high school gym <laughs> teacher. She had this um, dark pixie haircut, and she had a whistle, and she had a clipboard, <laughs> and she had a, and she had a, a, te a farmer's tan. Um, and her roommate was was Miss um, McClure, who was the third grade teacher. And Miss McClure, this was in the mid 1960s. And Miss McClure wore these little pencil skirts and these little kitten heels, and these beautiful blouses with little frills on them, and had that hair that you went and had your hair done once a week, you know. So, um, and this was in um, this was in Flagler County, um, before Palm Coast. It was a, there were like ten thousand people in the whole county. There were thirty people in my graduating class. We were K through twelve in one building. So we got to see Miss McClure and Miss Bradley every day, and um, so she was um, she was a lot. She was great fun. I don't know whatever happened to them, but I hope they lived happily ever after. <laughs> so. Here, in, um, and so in 2018, I wasn't even in town. Sue and I were, I don't know, off somewhere on vacation. Johnny Miller, who was then mayor, um, put the flag up on the flagpole at City Hall at kind of the end of June. And Which Teresa, year? Which year was 20, 2018, in June of, and Teresa was there. I don't really know how it all happened, but he was the mayor, and he just went out there and put the flag up. Well, holy crap. Um, so it went up, and, and then it came down, and then it went back up again, and it was up for like a week. And Teresa still has the flag, and everybody who was there that day signed it. I guess there were several dozen people there. And, um, you know, people were just having a stroke over it. So a couple of months later, in September of that year, I think, um, there was suddenly a resolution at City Hall that the only flags that could fly over City Hall was the American flag, the Florida state flag and the city flag. Of course, they don't have a city flag. But if they did, it could fly over City Hall, but that would be the only flags that could ever, for now into the forever, fly over City Hall. So, and I had met Teresa. Y'all were doing the, some, you were doing some potluck things and y'all were doing some conciliation, like conversations and some yeah, things. And. In 2016, um, in June, there was the Pulse shooting, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. And um, that was one of those just overwhelming, horrifying things for our community. And um, I, along with um, Johnny Miller, Linda Green, um, T Jim Tippins got together. I, I just went to them and said, I can't grieve this by myself. So we put together a service of um, hope and remembrance. And we did that, and we held it over at St. Peter's. And it was a standing room only um, event. It was amazing. So from that, we got a lot of people who were sort of interested in, um, made a lot of connections with a lot of LGBTQ folks that we didn't even know were here. Um, from that, um, New Vision Congregational Church started some community conversations. And one of those conversations was about the LGBTQ community in our area. Johnny attended that meeting. And one of the things that he said during that meeting was, you know, I think, you, well, a consensus was developed and what people said they would most like to see in Nassau County, Fernandina Beach was a human rights ordinance. And Johnny Miller, who was mayor at the time, said he felt that that commission at that time was more likely than any he had sat on to possibly pass it. Um, and after that, because Janice and I had talked um, a thing before and she had said something she really wanted to do was to pass a human rights ordinance. So a few weeks later, I called her and said, 
hey, you want to do a human rights ordinance? Um, but mm -hmm. there we go. And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a human rights ordinance. So now it's September. They're having this angst over a flag. They pass this resolution that says only these three flags can fly over City Hall. And so we're all there speaking out against it, saying, you know how short-sighted this is? I would say things like, well, what, what would happen if this football team like won a state championship? Wouldn't you want to fly their flag? I mean, wouldn't you be proud? You know, you're just cutting your nose off to bite your face, and, but oh no. But during those conversations, because you know they have to do two or three readings for a uh, resolution, so during those meetings, um, several of the city commissioners, and Roy Smith was one of them, poor thing, he outed a nephew or a great nephew or something. I was appalled that he would you know, get up and talk about his family like that, but he did, and I think he outed the poor man, so whatever. But he got up and said, why don't y'all just do a parade? Please, we don't need to fly a flag. Please do a parade. <laughs> I went, okay. <laughs> we can do a parade. So, thi so this was... Um, this was in the winter of 2018. And we were working on the human rights ordinance. We were also working on the human rights ordinance. It was clear that there was an election that year for the city commission, so it was probably smarter to do the HRO after the election. Um, so we kind of put it a little bit on the back burner. In the meantime, Lynn, Teresa and I had started talking to Lynn Krieger, and... Um, to be the sponsor for the HRO, which he agreed to do, and um, he, he just, it was just a better fit for him to do it than maybe for Johnny to do it. So the human rights ordinance is kind of trickling along. We had nothing, so it's not like we're just adding gender identity and sexual orientation to something we already had. We had to write the whole thing. And um, so we were working on that. But in the meantime, they were begging us to have a parade. So I said, okay, let's have a parade. So, well, in order to have a parade, you know, you really need to get yourself organized. So I said, okay, we can do that. So within just a couple of months, uh, Teresa was an original board member. We got ourselves organized. We got our 501c3. We got all our IS stuff together. We wrote bylaws. We did everything that you have to do to become a real organization. And so we did all that three or four of us, and um, so we said, okay, let's have a parade and a festival in June of 2019, and we said, well, okay, let's do that, so we started having these public meetings, and Gay Foot showed up, and other people showed up, they just like showed up, we call a meeting at the Peck Center, and people would just show up, so we started planning for a parade and a festival for June of 2019, and We'd have these meetings every couple of weeks, and what I would say to people is, okay, we got to raise $500. This is how much money we need to put on a parade and a festival. I got to get a permit. I got to do this. We got to have insurance. You know, there's all this stuff you have to do. You got to rent a stage, blah, blah, blah. So we had a budget. And um, I said, okay, we got to have $500 by the next time we meet, or we're going to have to cancel because we just got to have this money. And so we would have $500. It was the, the most amazing thing. I mean, Zen would do. We did a fundraiser at the Macedonia Church. We did potlucks. We did stone soup. We just, you know, people started sending us money. We put up a little sad little website that people could make donations to. Well, every couple of weeks we'd get together and I'd say, well, we need 500 more dollars and we would get it. Or I'd say, um, so we need a vendor coordinator. We need some, and then somebody after the meeting would stand up and say, I'll do that. Well, all of a sudden, we had a committee, we had an organization, we had money. So in June of 2019, we had our first parade and festival. We had no idea if anybody would come. Like a 1,000 people showed up. We were, like, blown away. Um, Kai Camellia was, um, had a store downtown where the Hawaiian trading place is now. And um, so Ray and them said, well, we'll sell your T-shirt. So... Um, the P5 people made t-shirts for us like on credit and didn't, we didn't have to pay for them right away. And so we started selling t-shirts for 20 bucks for cash out of um, Kai Camellia and that kind of funded us. 
I mean, every week or so, I'd go over and get my little stack of money, and I'd take on more T-shirts. And so it just kept coming together and coming together. So I had these all these artists who said they would play and musicians, and we had speakers, and we had we said if we could get 20 vendors, we'd be successful. Because my I come from a corporate background, and so you know I'm used to planning and setting goals and saying, okay, if you do this, you can go to here, you go to here. So he said, if we had 20 vendors, if we had th we had this whole list of things. Well, we ended up with like the first year like 35 vendors. So we were like, yay, and um, and so we had a festival, and we had a parade, and there was maybe just 10 or little groups or whatever. It was a small parade, but the best thing about the parade, and I can hardly talk about it without tearing up, is when we walked in front of the Methodist Church. And there was probably 300 people standing on the steps with signs that said, we love you. And then, and then we knew mm -hmm. that we could be safe here, we could be seen here, and we were part of this community. So it rained us out, because that's our <laughs> tradition. We get rained out at, at festivals. So Flip Turn, which is a local group mm -hmm. that gay knows and um they were actually going to be our closing group and play and all this stuff but it rained we got rained out so they didn't get to play but it was a great successful festival we made money we didn't have any issues and away we went and it, Janice can I just yeah um, so the group was this a membership organization by this time? No, we're not. We're still not we're a membership. Still not membership. We're still not a membership just organization. A we're just a five hundred one c three. We have a board of directors, and we're really just a volunteer organization. So you don't have to pay anything to join us. And um, so in the meantime, the HRO was kind of coming along, right? There had been an election. We'd done a little bit of work. So actually, we thought we could get the HRO passed before June, but for some reason, the all of a sudden the West Rock or the Rainier, I forget which one it is. I think it was people having concerns about West Rock and yeah. Rainier. And, not yeah. And so we ended up in July of twenty nineteen, the city commission passed um, unanimously a very strong human rights ordinance for the city of Fernandina Beach that covers public housing the public accommodations, employment, and I forget what the third thing is, ha housing. Housing, public accommodations, and employment. And it includes a whole litany of classes of different people that are, um, that are covered in that. So that's really something that the group was really, really proud of. So we start planning our 2020 event, and then you all know what happens in March of 2020. So for two years, we basically didn't do anything. Um, we tried to set up some plans for festivals, but we pulled back because um, the pandemic, it wasn't worth it. Um, so in 2021, we decided to do a drag queen bingo at the city golf course. And I had just had, I wasn't there. I had had my knee replaced the week before, so I was home with my leg propped up. And I don't know, like, we didn't sell tickets or anything. We just said we were going to do it. And I don't know what, Sue, maybe 200, 300 people showed up. I mean, we had to turn people away because there were so many people that showed up that wanted to play bingo. And then people were, like, throwing money at us and said, well, I can't come in, but here's some money. And we're going, oh, well, that works really well. We should try this again sometime. <laughs> so another, it became clear to us that, um, that we have a place in this community and we deserve to be here. Um, we created a scholarship fund, which I'm happy to say we've given away $8,000 in scholarships. To LGBTQ kids and ally kids in the school system, not just in Fernandina, but in the high schools all around the all around the um, the, the county. Um, in 2022, 
This is 2023, yep. So in 2022, we finally realized we could have another festival. So we had another festival last year. It was very well attended. We had probably 2,000 people show up. We had 50 vendors. We had, we didn't have to beg for money every week because we had money. Um, and so, uh, but we still had musicians offering to play and we had new people come up and say, I'll be the vendor coordinator. Um, thank you, Jordan. He's, um, he's our vendor coordinator this year as well. And so it just kind of continued to take off and we joined the Chamber of Commerce because I think it's important for us to just think like we're just, we're just another organization in the community. Mm -hmm. So we joined the Chamber, we, you know, we're not just raising money to raise money for ourselves, but we're raising money to give back to the community. Um, it's important to me and to the whole board that when we do things in the community, we want to do it, we want to spend our money here. So we make sure that we use local vendors wherever possible for the services or the, the, the things that we need, the merchandise that we need. P5 has been a wonderful sponsor for us and has um, always been there to help us. I've, we have to turn musicians away. We have to turn vendors away. We closed our vendor list this year with 70 vendors and we closed at the end of April. And we only opened it up like the middle of March. So within six, and we still today got people emailing us saying, can we please be a vendor on Saturday? And we go, no, <laughs> um, but you should try next year a little earlier. Um, so that, and so um, that's, you know, kind of where we are and how we are. We are, our focus is really on um, just providing people with a safe space and allowing this community to know that they're here, that they're safe, that they're welcomed, um, and that they're just, you know, part of community. One of the things we started last year, um, and we've had really limited success with it, so we've got to rethink how we want to do this, is setting up something for kids so that um, kids can have a safe place to go to um, on a regular basis and just you know be together. We got a grant from the LGBT Community Fund in Jacksonville to do it, so we had money to rent space and to, so there are two challenges for that program. One is transportation, and the other one is just getting the word out to these kids. So we tried to work through the schools a little bit and through the GSA clubs, which are the, um, Gay, they used to be called Gay Straight Alliances. Now they're called Gender and Something Something Alliance. Um, and we've worked through some churches that have been welcoming and affirming with us, um, but we're still not reaching the kids. So we're rethinking that strategy. Um, I think we quit hiding behind ourselves and just get out yeah. in the community and talk about it and talk it up and publicize it and and do that. So. So that's um, so that's kind of where we are, and we're going to have our great festival on Saturday. We've got probably tw three times the size of a parade than we've had before. We've got tons of people signing up for the parade still. We have 70 vendors. Mm -hmm. We have musicians. we got a couple of speakers. Angie Nixon, who's state representative from Jacksonville, is our keynote speaker. We've got food trucks. We got Kona ice, we got candy, we got all kinds of stuff. So um, so I would invite all of y'all to come. I had somebody tell me last week, because I was working on trying to button everything up, because as you know, we've had, um, there's, we've had some pushback this year. So one of the things I was researching this week is um, at what age may we hand out condoms? Because I'm getting challenged on it, so I need to know. So the Department of Health tells me we can hand out condoms to 13-year-olds and uh, older, but under 13, you have to have uh, consent, parental consent. I said, okay. So I'm talking to somebody in Jacksonville, who's one of our big vendors and one of our big supporters, about what's going on, and I was talking to him about it, um, and he said, why are you even asking these questions? What is the deal? So I told him a little, and he said, 
to me. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He said, y'all are the gold standard for a family-friendly event. He said, if it weren't for the flags and the banners, you wouldn't even know it was a gay pride event because it's just a community event, which is what we want because we understand what it means to live here. We're not, because I've been asked also, why don't you just go to the Jacksonville Festival? I go, because we're not Jacksonville. We're Fernandina. We have our own parade route. We have our own people. You know, people, Gay people who live in small towns deserve to be seen and, and respected as well. And it is, it's about community. It's about it's community, of this, of this community, community not the Jacksonville community, right. but this community right here. Do you have any idea what the size of the community is? So um, I just got asked that question actually the other I, day. We, uh, many of us just don't, I mean, we don't even so know. So nationally, you know. I started looking at census records and stuff, yeah. so there's a little bit. So nationally, it says that in the state of Florida, about 6% of the population identifies as okay. ALGBTQ. Um, so if you assume that we're just like everybody else, then um, so 5 6% of the community. Um, I would tell you one night at a party, we started writing a list of everybody we knew. <laughs> uh -huh. we, but if, you, if you take the families, you yeah, know, if you take yeah, the allies yeah. and the parents of, of uh, the community, your community is, the community, community. I'm thinking of is much, is much bigger. Is not yes. just the people who identify, yeah, right. but the people who uh, are support us, and, yeah, and, and welcoming. Have loved ones who and so we had 200 people show up on May 2nd at City Commission to speak to support um, our right to have the event. We had a picnic, which in April at the MLK, one of the MLK pavilions, which we've done those in before, and you know, 20 people show up. And we're happy, but over 100 people showed up for our ML for for our family picnic. So it's clear to me that we have a very large supportive community here. And as I told somebody recently, um, I have to like almost thank our haters because they've been able to energize the community in a way that we really have not in terms of people coming out of the woodwork, people showing up, money. I get you know, I, was, I get checks in the mail from just people that said, I want to support you, and here's $2,500. And I go, thank you very much for that. That'll go a long way to help kids with their scholarships. So, um, um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're here. We're happy to be here. And we love this community as everybody else does. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. And um, thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Thank you, Jill. Um, we're, run, we're running late on time, but I wanted to just give uh, Teresa and Don, uh, if you have anything final to say, and then we might have time for one or two questions. No, we can go like five minutes over. Okay. Uh, do you have anything to follow uh, up with, or? No, it's just I'm I'm I am delighted. I mean. It, this whole thing that started happening recently with the with Citizens Defending Freedom, is that the group? <laughs> um, it upset me so much because I did that 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, I went out there and I spoke and I talked and, and, and I know I changed people's minds. Um, and I just did not think that at the age of 73 I had to go out there and do it all over again. <laughs> you know, but but we are, we, we are doing it. And, yeah. um, and I am just, I am so delighted to see the support for our organization. I think um, through this last year, one of the things that I also would say is it has been wonderful to see our allies show up for us to show up at that city commission meeting and to say, we love these folks. They are part of our community. And mm -hmm. 
that means more than you can possibly imagine. But we are very thankful for that. And I think it reaffirms to me that, yes, we are a part of this community. And we have a lot of people in this community who love us and support us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very thankful for that also. Um, okay, I just want to uh, put in a plug too that uh, Summer and I will be down at a booth. Uh, the uh, museum is having a booth at the festival. For the first time. Thank Yay. you very much. And we're going to have a recording machine and we're going to be asking people, what does pride mean to you? And that, that's everybody. Okay, so come visit us. We'll be there. We have probably time for maybe one, two questions. Does anyone have a burning question? No. All right. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, yeah, indeed. What are we going to do about the book ban? <laughs> well, that, 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 uh, I said a quick question. Now, okay. Now, that, that is a, a time for another whole I started day. to say that yeah. that is a, um, a whole nother topic and and yeah probably worth a community conversation it probably is yeah yeah I think that uh, you know uh, many of us would uh, probably love to have a brown bag lunch that's about uh, how to support teachers and yep. libraries and bookstores so. and it's not just that so um, and I, I think I can say this. Um, so this morning, Robin Lentz called me. She's executive director for Take Stock and Children. Um, half of our scholarship funds have gone to Take Stock and Children kids. And um, they've been at our festival. And um, she has been instructed not to be there Saturday because they are just very, because so much of their money comes from the state. And they are waiting from guidance from their state organization as to um, how they can continue to work um, effectively with their kids. So they will be there. Um, they will not have a booth, but they will all be there. So it's not. So it's a much broader conversation, I think, that needs to go on right now. Um, and I think there are going to be a lot of court cases in the coming months they're already starting um but uh, you know we're just the current target and that will um as i told robin it's gonna it'll change mm -hmm. it's this what it is today but it's not going to be that way tomorrow so mm -hmm. do not worry that you can't be there this year because i expect you'll be there next yeah. so okay. well thank you again Thank you.